I grew up a military brat in San Diego, California. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 25 years, eventually reaching the rank of gunnery sergeant before he retired in 2011. I'm really proud of him and I love him very much, but I won't sugarcoat it. Growing up with a parent in the military wasn't easy. He wasn't at home much and when he was, he was something of a disciplinarian. I didn't have nearly as much freedom as some of my friends did, but that was as much of a boon as it was a burden because it kept me on track at school and gave me the means to get into a good college later on in life. But without a doubt, the worst part of him being in the Marine Corps was when he had to go to war. Although he wasn't part of the initial invasion force, Dad was deployed in Iraq in June of 2003. I was 11 years old at the time, and it really, really sucked having to say goodbye to him. No matter how much he tried to reassure us that he would be okay, I was old enough to be acutely aware that it might well have been the last time I ever got to talk to him, the last time I ever got to hug him, the last time I'd ever get to see him alive. Needless to say, the next six months were some of the most stressful of my life. Every little news report I saw on the TV gave me the worst anxiety, and every time we got news that a serviceman had died over there, I feared for the worse. Mom tried to shield me as best as she could, but as the risk of sounding a little full of myself, I was smart, inquisitive, and sensitive as a kid, and she could only do so much to keep me from worrying. So in September of 2003... Mom decided to take me to Disneyland for the weekend to take my mind off of things. To be honest, it was exactly what I needed. I was hugely into Disney movies when I was a kid, and although I'd been over to Disneyland a few times before, being so stressed around the house meant seeing it again was like doing so through fresh eyes. I took pictures with as many of the characters as I could, and each ride me and Mom went on seemed to alleviate my anxiety and depression that little bit more. The whole first day was going wonderfully well. That was until we got in line to ride the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I'm pretty sure it was about 11.30 by the time we got into the little rail cars for the ride itself. Everything was going smoothly at first. We're speeding along, all these twists and turns, until we hit the little fake desert set up and then up an incline into a dark tunnel. I just remember feeling like this jolting sensation shake the cars, all while we're in the dark, then this horrible grinding of metal and a thud before people in the cars in front of us started screaming. Everything came to a sudden stop, and everyone was all really shaken up from it. But it's then that I heard some of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. This woman starts asking out loud, Mark, 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 wake up, wake up, Mark. We're all mostly in the dark, but there's a little bit of light coming from the openings of the tunnel on each side of us, and I remember seeing how some of the cars weren't even on the tracks anymore, and that the cars in front of us were all wet and shiny with some kind of fluid, a fluid that I would only later realize to be someone's blood. In the moments after the rail cars came to a stop, people started clambering out of them and walking down the tunnel as fast as they could, calling out that someone was hurt really bad and that we needed help up there as soon as possible. As me and my mom climbed out of the rail car and followed, I could see that the train car thing at the very front of the coaster had derailed, and that the rear of the thing had like mounted the car behind it. It was only then that I realized that whoever was in the car behind it would have taken the full force of that thing as we sped up that incline. But there were also people in the cars ahead of us who were trapped by it, stuck in the rail cars and unable to get out because of the way they were positioned in the tunnel. Thankfully, me and my mom weren't trapped, so we could just get out of there, but I think it took like another half hour before firefighters could get them out so that paramedics could treat them before taking them to the hospital. All the people that could get out were herded off by park staff towards the River Bell Terrace, where a medical treatment area had been set up. Like I said... Me and mom were mostly okay, just a little shaken up from the whole thing, but there were people with some pretty serious injuries who hadn't been so lucky, and we later found out that the guy who had been in the first car had actually died of his injuries. It's horrendously tragic that someone should lose their life when all they wanted to do was go to Disneyland to have some fun on a few roller coasters. 
and I know it's kind of messed up for me to think of it like this, but we got really lucky that day, as way more people could have died, and honestly, I was surprised when I found out that it was only one person that lost their life that day. At least half the riders on the coaster could have died from the way that train just straight up mounted the cars behind it. Since that day, I've never, ever ridden a roller coaster, and theme parks in general just kind of creep me out. I know they're super fun, and I hope I get past my fear of them one day, but for the time being, I'm more than happy to just avoid them and stay safe, because even the sound of people screaming on them reminds me of Big Thunder Mountain, and the way that poor woman just kept screaming for her husband or son or whatever to wake up. Back in 1999, I used to work at Disney World down in Orlando, Florida. I was a custodian, which is really just Disney World's fancy way of saying janitor. We mostly worked when the park was closed to clean the place up, empty the trash, and treat all the water features around the park with cleaning chemicals to keep them from getting stagnant and smelly. But there was also a little guest interaction involved too, including things like giving directions, helping guests plan their day, and answering the millions of questions they'd have about the park. So I suppose my job was 70% janitor and 30% walking information point. There were major perks, but there were huge downsides too. I'd get disgruntled guests coming up to me and complaining about the stormy weather as it meant that some of the rides were closed for a few hours. So I'd have to deal with that, just smiling and nodding and sympathizing, but... Sometimes I swear it was like they wanted me to clap my hands and just magically disappear the clouds above our heads as if I had the power to do it. Like it's not my fault you choose to visit Disney World during a freaking hurricane season, dude, but make better choices, would you? I had to deal with lost children a few times too, and I also had to take valuable items to lost and found in Main Street, which was fun as it meant you could wander through Magic Kingdom on your way to the lost and found. That was one of the good things about being a custodian. You're allowed to walk all over the park, within reason. For instance, if a guest wanted directions to Space Mountain, I could walk them over to Tomorrowland instead of just telling them how to get there. This worked well when trying to communicate with guests who didn't speak any English. I had a lot of good times during that job. The whole team was like one big family. But I suppose that's why what I'm about to tell you happens to be probably the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire life, and why it still kind of messes me up 21 years later. So this happened on the second weekend in February of 99. The actual park opened at 11am, so we used to spend the first two or three hours of our shifts basically doing cosmetic cleans, testing rides, and generally making sure the park was ready to go for the day. The morning section of my shift involved helping out with cleaning and prepping Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. So at one point, I'm walking through the park and I see this guy, Ray, up on the platform for the Skyway in Fantasyland. He's sweeping away, whistling to himself, generally being the cheerful guy that he was. Ray was in his 60s at the time and had already been with us for like a year. Everyone liked him. He was older than most, but he was super chilled out and friendly and always willing to help out his fellow cast members. Like I said, we were one big family like that. We worked together, partied together, and some of us even lived together. I called up to him like, Morning Ray Ray. He just smiles down at me, returns the greeting and waves a little before going back to his sweeping. It was a beautiful morning. Everyone was in a good mood, it was another day in literal paradise in my mind. So I'm walking towards Tomorrowland for a few more minutes when I hear like this slow electric whirring sound above my head. The sound of the skyway starting up as the four person gondolas start moving along the track. I still feel terrible that it took me as long as it did to realize what was so wrong about the situation. It was a Sunday morning and... I was pretty tired and slightly hungover from having gone out drinking the night before with a few of the other cast members. Honestly, it took me a little while to stop blaming myself for not having prevented what happened, because I figured that if I'd been a little sharper, I'd have been able to really help. But then it hits me. The gondolas are moving, 
pretty fast too on their first test loop and Ray is still up on the platform. Someone has switched on the Skyway and they hadn't checked if the thing was clear or not. So I just start running back the way I'd walk, following the platform of the Skyway and hoping I'd catch up to Ray before the gondolas reached him. I was running as fast as I could, trying to catch up with the lead gondola, but I just couldn't seem to close the distance in time. I look up and see Ray whistling away to himself with his back to the gondolas, just not seeing them at all as they're approaching. So I start shouting to him and trying to warn him before the gondolas knocked him off the skyway, which are like 60 feet up in the air. He hears me, turns around, and is obviously horrified to see that someone had turned the skyway on before checking if it was clear. He has this mix of anger and fear in his voice as he turns back around and starts moving as quickly as he can away from the gondola, but he just couldn't move fast enough. The thing caught up with him pretty quickly, but it didn't knock him off right away. Ray grabbed onto the gondola and tried to pull himself inside of it to stop himself from falling, but he just wasn't strong enough, and all of a sudden I'm watching him dangling from the thing in danger of falling the whole 60 feet onto the concrete below. I'm just shouting up to him, hang on Ray, just hang on. But there was nothing I could do. I just had to watch him struggle to hold on to that gondola as it moved along the skyway, knowing it was only a matter of time before he lost his grip and fell. I can see Ray looking over his shoulder and down at the ground below him every so often and I'll never ever forget the look of absolute terror on his face, or that feeling of pure helplessness I felt as I watched the whole thing unfolding. Then the gondola starts passing over these flower beds instead of just pure concrete. I figured the soil and plants would have to be a better option to fall onto. It had to be. So I just start shouting, Jump, Ray! Jump the flower beds! Let's go! Then I don't know if he deliberately let go or just lost his grip, but... He fell, 60 whole feet down, landed with an audible thump in the flower beds below him. Watching him fall was like slow motion or something. He seemed to fall so slowly, but I guess that's just because he had such a long way to fall. He was in a bad, bad way when I reached him. He wasn't moving at all. He just laid there among the flowers, all glassy-eyed, and he wheezed and groaned in agony, and in the moment before I ran off to get help, I saw him spit up blood onto his bottom lip and chin. I was in tears by the time I found another cast member to help out, begging them to call 911 so we could get an ambulance out as fast as possible. Emergency services got there less than 20 minutes later, and they carried Ray out of the park on a stretcher before driving him over to Orlando Regional Medical Center. We all prayed that he'd be okay and it brought us all a great deal of hope that he'd actually landed on the flower beds and not on the straight concrete, which definitely would have killed anyone who'd fallen that far. But a few hours later, we got word that he hadn't made it, that his injuries were so bad that he had passed away despite what the hospital staff had done for him. The fall caused too much trauma, too much internal bleeding, and he had slipped away after they'd operated on him to drain the blood from his lungs. We were all absolutely devastated to have lost such a cheerful, charming, and dedicated cast member. Ray made all of our days just that little bit brighter, and it would be impossible to really replace him. I felt for his family, I felt for his friends, but I really felt for the cast member who had turned on the gondolas before making sure the skyway was clear. Technically, Ray should have been done with his sweeping by that time in the morning, but like I said, he was dedicated and the kind of guy who didn't finish a job until it was properly done. The person had turned on the Skyway, who I won't name, was totally inconsolable, so much so that they had to be put on leave before they eventually quit. They blamed themselves for Ray's death, saying they should have checked the cameras, done a walk around to make sure the platform was clear. It was no one's fault. I've come to terms with that. It was a simple breakdown of communication, and it could have happened to anyone. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't Ray's fault. It wasn't the Skyway operator's fault. 
it was just a horrible twist of fate. Everyone that could get time off attended Ray's funeral. We all wanted to be there for his family as best we could to assure them that their husband and father was one of the sweetest guys we'd ever known. Ray was the first cast member to die in the park in over ten years, and a little memorial was put up backstage for him so that we could all remember him at his best with a smile on his face instead of scared and broken. Rest in peace, Raymond Barlow. We love you. And we miss you every single day. It's every kid's dream to go to Disney World, right? It's a dream that a lot of American kids never get to have come true, let alone British kids. So I always felt extremely fortunate and privileged that my parents were not only financially capable of taking our family over to Florida for couple weeks, but also that they actually put the time aside to do something like that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't want to. I mean, no offense to anyone that does, but what kind of actual grown-up wants to spend all that time queuing up for rides in the baking hot sun after paying for overpriced churros and chocolate sauce? That's not even touching on the pure scam that is Disney dollars. But still... My parents relented to mine and my sister's pleas to take us all the way across the Atlantic to arguably the craziest state in the Union, Florida. This happened a long time ago, back in 1998, so excuse me if I misremember any details about the park itself. But I remember the year pretty clearly because of the game StarCraft had just come out, and I was fortunate enough to pick up a copy in the US before it was even commercially available in the UK. To 10-year-old me... Florida was like the land of the lost or something. I mean, it had actual dinosaurs, i.e. Uh, alligator farms, where you could feed the big old beasts with hunks of meat, something I was way too scared to do myself, but was only too happy to watch my dad do before he scampered away down the wooden walkway like he was regressing into a childlike state out of pure primal fear. It was the land of Tropicana, where the food portions dwarf those in the UK, and the grass and trees were so different and fantastical that I might as well have landed on a paradise alien world. It was the Sunshine State in name and in nature, and of course, it was the home of the most magical place in the entire universe, Disney World. But it was during our third and final day trip to Disney World that something happened that I didn't properly understand until I was a great deal older. The truth of which my parents tried their best to shield me and my little sister from for as long as they could. And this is how it happened. So, I remember we were in the animal kingdom part of the park. I was always really interested in natural history when I was growing up, so I was particularly excited to see this part of Disney World and was incredibly happy and excited to be there. I had to wait three whole days at Disney before we finally got to see that particular part of it and every other kid there seemed to be just as happy as I was, all except one. On the shuttle bus out at the park, I remember seeing this one little girl with her dad, who looked uncharacteristically miserable for a kid who actually had the good fortune to be visiting Disney World. But I mean, there's always one moody kid out of the bunch, isn't there? One who never seems to have any fun no matter what's happening. So honestly, as confused as I was about it, I forgot about it pretty quickly as my own excitement at seeing all the animals quickly overwhelmed me. My favorite Disney film was The Lion King, so go figure, I was buzzed. But throughout the day, whether we were on the rides or on the little safari tour thing, or eating at one of the cafes there, I'd see this little girl and her dad, and she looked consistently exhausted and unhappy. I found myself starting to point where my mum and dad were like, Stop staring at other kids, it's rude. So, I did, because I knew they were right. Of course it was rude to stare, and besides that, the little girl seemed awfully upset, and surely me just staring at her would only make it worse. So a little while later, I remember walking along drinking one of those ginormous American zillion-ounce sodas or whatever, happy as Larry, when I see the little girl and her dad in front of us. I'm not going to pretend to be all like, I knew something was wrong. I sensed it, because I didn't. Not at all. 
But one thing struck me as kind of odd about the whole thing. By the time I was ten, I hated holding my mum or dad's hand. It was what babies did, I'd say, and like me, this little girl didn't seem all that keen on holding her dad's hand and at one point even tried to shake it loose, but he kept holding on to her, and at one point started properly gripping her wrist and telling her to behave. I obviously found this kind of distressing, and I looked up at my dad as if to be like, are you seeing this? Half expecting to be told to stop staring again. Both my parents looked kind of concerned about what was going on, but I didn't dare say anything. I was old enough to know that some kids misbehave sometimes, and people around had that kind of cringy, pretend it's not happening kind of feeling about them. Only then, instead of just calming down, the little girl just bursts into tears and starts wailing, I want my mommy, I want my mommy, while the guy is trying his best to calm her down, all like, we'll get you to mommy soon, sweetie, and all this other stuff that he was saying. What happened next is kind of a blur in my memory. There was just a lot of commotion, but this is how my dad tells the story from his perspective. Apparently, while the little girl is waiting, my dad hears her blatantly say, I want daddy, where's daddy? And the way he tells it, the mood in the crowd around us like visibly shifts as it suddenly becomes obvious that this guy that had been taking her around the park was not her father. There's slight hesitation though. No one actually acts on the revelation for the first few minutes or so, and for good reason, the guy might have been her uncle, a family friend, a legal guardian or carer. There was nothing evidently insidious about it. That is until the guy snaps at her in a way that is distinctly unparental. Apparently some other American dad was all like, is there a problem buddy? Or something, and the guy is quick to calm the situation down by telling them that no, there's no problem, the little girl's just having a temper tantrum. Then someone asks if the guy is actually the girl's dad, to which he apparently replies, yes, before trying again to reassure the gathering crowd that everything was okay and that she was just having a tantrum. Now the next part I remember pretty clearly, because the girl shouted something before the man with her clamps her hand over her mouth so hard it sounded like a slap. My mom starts pulling me and my sister away from the scene since it was starting to turn ugly, like really ugly, really fast. According to my dad's version of it, what the girl had screamed before the guy tried to shut her up is that he wasn't her dad at all. Not only that, but he had took her. And that's when it starts getting confusing for me again because all kinds of people started moving forward and blocking my view and all the shouting and moving kicks off. But I do remember seeing this tubby woman shoving her way through the crowd of people with that same little girl in her arms who by that point was just sobbing uncontrollably. After that I remember seeing the crowd that had formed around the guy begin to sway and shift. There were shouts and screams. I mean like the kind of screams that were so intense and frightening that they made me shake and shiver with fear and had my little sister bursting into tears. By the time park security showed up who 10 year old me just assumed were the police, the crowd began to disperse and I distinctly remember seeing the man who had apparently taken the little girl from God knows where pinned to the ground with someone on top of him. That's about the only part that I can remember crystal clear to this day. A lot of my memory has been filled in with my mom and dad's retelling of the event but the image of that guy's rage, how it twisted up in his features is still burned into my mind and it's been made all the more sinister by the fact that I now know what he was so angry about. He'd taken that girl and kept her pliant because he'd promised her a trip around Disneyland. She was probably so keen to go that she just hadn't fought back, and God knows what he was intending to do with her afterward. But that chance had been taken away from him by a bunch of do-gooders, at least that's the way I imagine he thought of it. Playing this sick long game of lolling his prey into a false sense of security before he finally got his way with her. Not that I realized any of that at the time. To ten year old me it was all just this big mess of confusion and fear. But knowing that whatever was going on was just very, very wrong. We have no idea what happened to the man or the little girl after that. No one spoke of it again for the rest of the holiday and I'm pretty sure it was almost five or six years before one of them brought it up with me and explained exactly what the situation was. 
As far as I knew, all I'd seen was a dad mistreating his daughter who had then been arrested for it. And even to this day it screws in my head that one of the worst things I'd ever witnessed happened in what was billed as the happiest place on earth. And how if things had gone just a little differently, that girl could have been a corpse or worse. A few days later and none of us would be any the wiser. Thank God she spoke up when she did. Thank God that there were people there that reacted the way they did, because I really don't want to think about the alternative. So a few summers ago, the old ball and chain and I took the kids down to Florida for a week so they could visit Disney World. It was a win-win situation. They would actually stop hounding us to take them there while us grown-ups could soak up the tropics for a whole seven days to experience what an actual summer feels like. Don't get me wrong, I love my native state of Maine, but the only thing scarier than Stephen King's books is the weather here. As the saying goes, don't like the weather in New England? All you gotta do is wait a minute. So we're down in Orlando for the week and the arrangement is we'll spend three days at Disney World with a day on either side where the grown-ups can do fairly grown-up things. So we're walking around the city, seeing some sights and baking in the Florida sunshine. I get the one thing I'd really been after which was a huge Cuban sandwich. So the kids are being corralled by their mom while I'm trailing behind trying not to pass out from ingesting my body weight in pork, bread and cheese. So at one point... My wife needs to use the bathroom, so I'm in charge of keeping an eye on the kids while she runs off to find somewhere that'll let her use the bathroom without making her open her purse. Now admittedly, this is where I feel short of being my best as a father. I find a bench nearby, plant my bottom down on it, and tell the kids to stay where I can see them, which, since I shut my eyes and start sunbathing like the disgusting greasy lizard person I was, was a little redundant. Next thing I know... I'm about to doze off when I kind of jerk out of my haze thinking, oh, the kids. I get up, look around, and see my son like halfway down the street, talking to some guy dressed as Mickey Mouse. I knew that the Disney characters appeared outside of the parks on occasion, but all the way in downtown Orlando? I was a little confused, but more relieved than anything since they hadn't disappeared into thin air, which would have ruined more than just our vacation, I can tell you that much. So I'm walking down towards Mickey when I start to realize there's something not quite right about him. The Mickeys in the park were super animated, being theatrical movements to keep the kitties entertained and stuff. This one was anything but. While my kids are basically dancing around him, wicked excited to see him outside of the parks, Mickey is just kind of staring at them. Almost like Mickey Mouse had taken a few Mickey pills. Sorry, dad joke, comes with the territory. But it's only as I get really close do I start to really see how this particular Mickey isn't just acting wrong. He looks wrong too. It wasn't just that shape and color of his copyright dodging costume was all off kilter. It was the fact that it was filthy. I mean, I get that those things mustn't be the easiest things in the world to wash. Like, I'm pretty sure just the head wouldn't fit in the washer dryer we had at home. But this thing was covered in dirt and old stains. Like it looks seriously, seriously gross and I dread to think what that thing smelled like on the inside. Look, I'm not a total jerk. I understood, or at least I thought I understood, what the deal was with the guy in the knockoff suit. No one in a stable financial situation chooses to wear a stinky old Mickey the Rat suit or whatever and parades themselves around downtown Orlando. So as the kids are still running circles around the dude, who I figured was just exhausted and half heat-stroked, I reach into my wallet and go to hand him a 20. But the guy just looks at me, or rather, the guy didn't. The head did. Which I did not anticipate to be so creepy. This pair of big, black, lifeless eyes just staring me down from a few feet away seriously rustled my jimmies. I kind of thrust the 20 in his general direction like, Hey dude, take the money. And the guy actually tilts the head at me. I mean like a well-rehearsed horror movie move. And obviously I respond by putting the 20 back in my wallet as to not offend him any further. I call my kids back to me because their mom is probably wondering just where in the world that we've gotten. And they're all like, oh dad, 
Can we play with Mickey a little while more? While Mickey goes back to staring at them, which obviously is now making me super uncomfortable. I'm now insisting in my best stern dad voice that they do as they're told or I'd be telling their mom, she's the tough one, that they've been misbehaving. As they do, Mickey reaches out to try to grab at my then seven-year-old son. Red line crossed right there. Don't touch my kids unless I know you. So I step to the guy and state just that, that he has absolutely no right to lay a hand on my kids, especially not in that suit. Mickey then takes to just staring at me again, and this whole time, he's not made a single sound. I take both my kids by the hand, who are getting pretty distressed at this point since Dad is being mean to Mickey, and Mickey isn't exactly acting his usual cheerful self either. I make a show of apologizing to the man for being curt with him, then try to make it one of those teachable moments as I walk away with the kids making it clear to them that no adult is allowed to touch them without their express permission, and that strangers are most definitely not allowed to touch them, and to tell mom or dad if they do. But then I make the mistake of looking over my shoulder where I see Mickey, still staring at me, and somehow managing to be even creepier than before. That night, I couldn't sleep. I was so not used to how humid Florida could be, our motel room's air conditioner had been very well behaved all week, but had picked that night of all nights to start malfunctioning. Thank God the kids' room's unit was working hard, but ours, not so much. So I end up getting out of bed and sitting at the little table in the kitchenette while I drink a glass of something that ended up being more ice than water, just trying my best to cool down so I can get back to sleep. We had the flight home the next day, so I needed to be as sharp as possible so I didn't screw up and lose boarding passes or whatever. Now just so you know, the motel that we were staring at was all bungalows, single story units in a horseshoe shape, and the one we were staying in happened to face the highway outside. I take a walk over to the window to take one final look at the Florida night. Like I love vacationing there and I totally understood why it's the retiree's destination of choice. But as I'm looking out through the blinds, I see something out there that makes my jaw drop. Outside, silhouetted by the street lights, standing still as a statue over near the highway, is this really obviously Mickey Mouse shape. The big circular ears, oversized hands, the works. I actually say like, no effing way man, out loud to myself as the realization hits me. That knockoff Mickey Mouse guy from Orlando had somehow figured out where we were staying. Okay, so I have no idea how he managed to work that out. It's something I still think about from time to time, but the only concrete thing I have in my mind is that, when not wearing that suit, he could have looked like just about anyone, so he could have followed us all the way back to the motel on foot or in a car or something, and I'd have no idea we were even being stalked. But like I said, since we left Florida the next day and I only talked to the cops down there one time, I have absolutely no definite answers on how that guy found us. So, I just find myself rushing back to the kitchenette to grab a knife from the drawer, which might seem like something of an overreaction to some of you, but I can't overstate the fear I was feeling at that moment. Something happens when you're a dad, something where you're just not willing to roll the dice with your kid's safety. So whatever was about to happen, there was no way I was going into it with just my fists. So knife in hand, I rush back to the window and look out, to see that no one is there anymore. Note that I say no one and not nothing, because lying in the parking lot about a hundred meters closer to the motel room is the entire knockoff Mickey Mouse costume, just lying there on the tarmac. I'm just staring at the thing in terror for a moment, like, this guy just stripped off his costume about 15 seconds and is now nowhere to be seen. Then what happened next is literally something out of a horror movie. I'm checking the peripheries of the parking lot trying to spot the guy when, boom, he appears right in front of the window and bangs his head, yes, his actual head, onto the glass window so hard I thought it would knock the entire pain out. I almost had a heart attack right there. And whatever yelpy scream wail I made when the guy appeared immediately woke up the wife and kids. I tell the missus to get in the kids' room, lock the door behind her, and call the cops. 
which after a few terrified questions pertaining to just what was going on, she did. I'm guessing the window pane was like security glass or something because this guy, who by the way was completely naked from head to toe, couldn't seem to break it no matter what he threw at it. Fists, forehead, whatever, it just boomed and shook in the frame. The whole time I'm just waving this knife at him and shouting that the cops are on the way, the cops are on the way, the second of which he seems to respond to far more than the former. But still, he switches his attention to the door, trying to bash it open as I rush over to the kids' room and ask my wife if the cops had sent anyone yet. I hear her respond with a yes and by the time I get back to the window, the banging had stopped and the empty Mickey suit is gone from the parking lot. I just watched that parking lot until I saw the blue flashing lights approaching, and only then was I really able to breathe properly. I gave statements to the cops who arrived, told them all about the earlier interaction I had with a guy, and figured it would be pretty easy for them to find a guy who would be butt naked if he didn't have this huge Mickey Mouse suit on. But like I said, it wasn't like we were there for much longer, and the next day we caught the plane back home to Maine and back to reality. I had to get on the phone to the Orlando Police Department to see if there had been any developments at all, which, to my surprise, there hadn't. There hadn't been a single arrest relating to the incident that night, despite having questioned several Disney cast members, both current and former. I know that might seem like a really anticlimactic way to end the story, that no one was caught, nothing was resolved, and I have absolutely no revelatory or illuminating piece of info to share to make you all be like, oh my god, the call was coming from inside the house or something. But that really is where the story ends. The guy found us, he terrorized us, and then we got out of Florida. I suppose I can end by saying that I'm looking forward to going back at some point when the kids are older and they have no interest in going to Disneyland, but definitely not anytime soon and definitely not to downtown Orlando. There is a place in central Florida known simply as Celebration. Conceived in the 1990s as a civil project by the Disney Development Company, Celebration was once touted as the definitive dream destination for Walt Disney fanatics, where they could escape the dreary reality of their everyday lives to live, either temporarily or permanently, in their very own residential dreamland. Twenty-three years ago, the Walt Disney Company invested just short of $5 billion into its planning and eventual construction on the outskirts of Disney World near Orlando, Florida. And over the years, the streets became lined with quaint, picturesque homes, painted white, yellow, pink, tan, or blue, and bordered by white picket fences with lush green gardens. When fall rolled around, Celebration was known to ship in containers full of brown fallen leaves from northern states to waft around the carefully constructed streets and piazzas. During the holiday season, fake snow was poured over rooftops to give a distinctly Christmassy feel despite the balmy temperatures. All the while, local trees were fitted with small, barely visible speakers while playing unceasing melodies of songbirds, and just in case the unnerving, uncanny valley nature of the town isn't enough to creep you out, wait until you learn of the dark past that Disney's seemingly perfect town has hidden beneath the veneer of perfection, including tales of seedy escapades, murder, people taking their own lives, and what is terrifyingly referred to as the Death Pond. On the surface, Celebration appears to be exactly what it is billed as, the happiest place on earth. Shortly after it was established as a census community, the town expanded and became capable of housing over 10,000 people, complete with a local hospital and school, along with a commercial district that could cater to its many denizens. The place was so seemingly perfect that residents soon began to refer to the town as the bubble, because it was almost like living in a parallel universe. There are others who compare it to something out of the Stepford Wives film and more recently the movie Get Out, where an appearance of civility hides dark, foreboding secrets. But not long after the town was established, cracks soon began to appear, 
both figuratively and literally with shoddily constructed buildings, painfully strict rules, a dysfunctional and weird school, and even some unexplained deaths among its residents. Celebration might have been many things, but it was not a Disney theme park. It was a real town with a real problem, journalist and author L.J. Charleston once wrote. Plans for the town were initially announced in early 1994. Requests for residency there were initially so great that the Disney Development Company organized a lottery that people could join in order to be eligible for a chance of snapping up one of the 500 homes. At first they expected no more than a few thousand applications to be received. In the end they found themselves with over 10,000 families who longed for a little slice of residential heaven. According to the original marketing and sales brochure, Celebration claimed that there once was a place where neighbors greeted neighbors in the quiet of summer twilight, where children chased fireflies and porch swings provided easy refuge from the cares of the day, a place where the movie house showed cartoons on Saturday mornings, the grocery store delivered, and there was always a teacher who always knew you had that special something. Remember that place? Its name is Celebration. Yet as residents arrived in their droves, complaints of the painfully artificial prettiness and physical imperfections began as a trickle of gripes and grumbles grew into a torrent of discontent. Supposedly, it was compulsory that every single new home had to have the image of Mickey Mouse displayed somewhere on the property, and that was just one of the plethora of rules in the 160-page regulations book that residents were expected to follow. Other rules stated that only a certain variety of plants were permitted to be growing in the town's gardens, and special pathways were said to have been constructed at the rears of homes to conceal garbage cans and vehicles, which were said to be unsightly. This is on top of the fact that residents were said to have only been allowed to have certain colors of curtains, and had to keep their carefully cut lawns at a specific uniform length. Jan and Ori Scheisel, a retired couple from Michigan and longtime residents of Celebration, told a British newspaper that if you're not one for rules and regulations, we can promise you, you really don't want to live here. They told a visiting journalist that no two adjoining houses could look alike, how no household could have more than two vehicles visible in its driveway, and that blinds or curtains could be any color at all, but had to be white on the outward facing side to give the homes a uniform look. If you don't have enough bark in your ground cover or you have dead plants on your porch, they'll send you a strongly worded letter, Mr. Scheisel said. But as the years went by, more sinister events were to visit themselves on the seemingly perfect town. In 1998, Celebration's tight-knit community was horrified by the news of an armed home invasion. A couple were bound and gagged in their own home by a gang of masked burglars, who proceeded to beat them mercilessly while they emptied the home of valuables. Then in November of 2010, a 58-year-old teacher named Matteo Giovandito, who lived alone with his pet chihuahua, was strangled unconscious with a shoelace before their body was chopped into pieces with a fire axe. Neighbors of Giovandito only became suspicious when he didn't show up to school to teach their kids. Local law enforcement then made the grisly discovery when... They knocked on his door and were greeted by the stench of decay. David Israel Murillo, who was homeless at the time, received a life sentence for the murder. He tried to defend his actions to police by saying that he flew into a rage after Mr. Giovandito tried to assault him. In the aftermath of the murder, former students of Giovandito confessed that he had touched them after inviting them to sleepovers at his house. One student's mother detailed that Mr. Giovandito, who she referred to as a cunning predator, developed a close relationship with her 10-year-old son. She claimed the teacher assaulted her son while on school trips to countries including Mexico, Japan, and China. But the boy suddenly cut ties with Giovandito and she later learned that he had been abusing him for years. Then, just days after Matteo Giovandito's death, a neighbor of his named Craig Fushi barricaded himself in his own house for around 12 hours and began shooting at police officers outside, who had only showed up to question him regarding the murder. No officers were hurt in the shootout, but when they gained entry to the house, they found Mr. Fushi 
dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. It is believed that Fushi was involved in what had happened to the local children. There was also talk of a death pond near the tranquil town. Up until the late 90s, there were no warnings on the nearby road that if you took a wrong turn, you risked driving into the alligator-infested water. Several incidents gave the pond its macabre name. Perhaps the most infamous concerned three young men who had been vacationing in Florida during the summer of 1998 before they mysteriously vanished. The bodies were discovered nine months later inside a car at the bottom of the lake. A two-year-old boy was also eaten by an alligator as he played by the pond's edge. A property investor named Malcolm Longley, who had been relocated to Celebration from Maidenhead, also claimed that there was a sleazy element to life in Celebration, with the act of wife-swapping being widespread. We call it Celebration Separation, he said during an interview in 2010. Pretty much all the British people I know who have moved here have come happily married and ended up divorced. It's an incestuous town, and there's an element of wife swapping. I'd never met swingers that much until I came here. He admitted that he had seen some move to celebration to hide away from problems and find some fairy tale ending, but they don't get it. After many years of strife and struggle, 2004 saw Disney selling celebration to a company based out of New York City. Since then, many residents have hid out at the creepy reputation it has garnered. In response to a defamatory blog post, one resident wrote, I have lived in Celebration for nine years, and I love it. The best part about Celebration is the wonderful and caring people. I absolutely love living here. It is not creepy at all. Everyone is really friendly, and it is beautiful. The current problems are for people living in condos, not houses. So many people that live here think it's the best place in the world to live and that they are truly blessed. Where else do you have beautiful walking trails, a selection of community pools to use, community events, and the ability to see multiple displays of fireworks every single night of the year? Plus, it is located so close to Disney, Universal, and SeaWorld, so I am able to go to a free concert all the time with my annual passes. What's not to love about this beautiful town? And a second confirmed that they had lived in celebration for almost 10 years and wouldn't live anywhere else. It has a true community feel that I've never had anywhere else. Our town is far from perfect, but it's a place full of wonderful people. I love raising my kids here. Yet both posts have been thought to have been written by marketing executives employed by the new Northeastern owners in an attempt to reserve the fortunes of the failing town. The official Celebration website states that Celebration was founded with the concept of building a better place and a better way to live. There's a reason celebration is not a town, but a community in every positive sense of the word. But scratch the surface, and it appears that behind the facade of perfection, sinister events lurk behind almost every corner, and that for many, moving to the town did not make for celebration, but devastation, abuse, and death. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord, interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, keep your mouth shut, or I'll find you. <laughs>